What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Real Bodybuilding Podcast, and I am here with Hall of Famer Kevin Lavroni. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, man. I'm uh, good to uh, for us to finally connect the dots and <laughs> yeah. make this happen, right? Yeah, I've been trying to. I've, I messaged you a few times. I know you're extremely busy. Um, you know, supplement company and all the other things you got going on. So uh, it's nice to finally have you on. So thank you very much yeah. for making the time. Well, thank you, man. And uh, looking forward to it. I've heard a lot of good things about your uh, podcast. And my uh, my good friend, brother from another mother trading partner, Scott Rayner, has been raving, man. You got to go on Fuad's show. You got to go on the show. He's got the number one podcast out there. And, uh, you know, yeah. hey, he reached out. I believe he reached out to you, yeah? He did. He did. We were trying to, we were trying to connect things also. And then I said, look something's getting missed so let's just just have kevin contact me and mm -hmm. we'll we'll set it up but tell him i appreciate it also uh yeah give telling you kind of giving you a push to come on because um i think there's a lot of things that people want to know so let's get into it i i thought of a lot of questions but the first one that came to mind was um your comeback mm -hmm. i wanted to ask you when you came back what was the and this is probably kind of a a selfish and personal reason because i'm thinking about coming back to the stage myself but what was the catalyst that made you come back after so long being off um the catalyst was i if you remember back in 2003 when i had uh, stopped competing i never announced there's not one video anywhere of me announcing my retirement mm -hmm. uh, from the sport which a lot of athletes always do do that i left the sport because I was just tired of trying, tired of getting second place. I got second at the Olympia uh, four times, um, you know, runner up to Mr. Olympia. And just being that close, you kind of like, man, how many times, you know, is this going to keep happening before you really say, you know what, they're just not going to give it to me. Um, and when you do get second, those are like close seconds. Mm -hmm. So, that light bulb goes off and reality sets in and you realize that, you know what, I want every show in the world more than once. <laughs> yeah. What is it about this Miss Olympia that I just cannot win? And um, I had beaten everyone before uh, on the Miss Olympia stage, uh, except Dory Yates. So when he retired, I thought, wow, you know, I might have a shot, which was in 2000. Yeah. I gave it all I had in 2000 and I came back and, I felt as though um, I had Ronnie uh, because at that show he had a uh, his you know he had just put on a little more size and lost some lines around the midsection even though he was massive but I, I felt like I had the complete package. After that, I mean, it was like um, the wind kind of like got over out of my sails. I never complained for what you know. I yeah. never complain about any of my places. I've always sucked it up re regardless. And just move forward. And that's that's part of being a champion. I never was a better loser. And when I won, I never I never bragged about who I beat or or anything or claimed to be, you know, so much more superior than anyone else. But um, 14 years of competing for what and, and seven shows every year. I mean, that's a lot. And, yeah. um, you know, my goal was to win the Miss Olympia. And if I couldn't do it after all that, then I figured, you know, it just wasn't happening. Yeah. So I walked away from the sport. But I still had. I still had that fire. There was something down inside that just wasn't sitting right with me. Unfortunately, it took 14 years for me to come back just to put that little, you know, that Rocky movie, yeah. something burning in the base, <laughs> burning in the base. Something down right? there. Yeah. 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 Bro, I'm telling you, man, that, that shit was burning me up. It was constantly burning me up. And then you see the new, the new catalyst come in, the new guys come in and everything. And you start thinking, you still there mentally, but you know what? Unfortunately, you're not there as far as, yeah. you know, your physique goes and everything. So what was happening with me, it was something internal that I had to just get out, you know, yeah. and um, I had to go back and revisit that area. And I'm glad I did, man, because I, 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 I put everything to rest. Yeah. Everything to rest, you know, that I, I feel good. I feel good that I did it, you know? When you did that show, I remember, I remember the excitement. And people were comparing you to Phil Heath and people were like, Kevin's going to come back and he's going to look like he did in 2000. And mm -hmm. when you came back and you weren't, and again, this is a selfish question, 
when you when you came back and you weren't at your best, did it matter to you or was it still satisfying because you were just trying to satisfy that internal need to get back on stage? No, it it mattered to me as a as a competitor. Mm -hmm. um, it always matters. And you always comparing yourself to what you want to look like or what you're so used to seeing in that mirror. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I woke up and it just wasn't there. Uh, my legs just wasn't there. I'm not one to complain about excuses. I, I, I don't care about that. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just wasn't happening. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, so there's some medical reasons and age and everything. And uh, I think, uh, uh, what do you call it? The tendonitis and everything. Yeah. But you know what? Um, I put my mouth before, uh, before everything else because mentally you think you still got it. Yeah. So I put it out there. Hey, I'm coming back. You know, and I went yeah. down Pittsburgh. I put it out there. <laughs> I think Olympia was like six or seven months away. I don't even know, man. But yeah. at that point, I haven't even been in the gym after 14 years. So uh, kind of put my foot in the mouth. And, but I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy who uh, who backs down from a challenge, who who comes up with uh, some crazy excuse and, mm -hmm. and drop out. And, and I had committed. And it was the commitment coming from me being at my best mentally when I know where I can go. Mm -hmm. And I tried it. I got, I gave it everything I did in that short period of time. And um, it just wasn't enough time with what I was dealing with the time had, that I had taken off and, and the age and everything. It just, it just wasn't, uh, I just couldn't pull it off. So if you, if the competitive part of it mattered to you after walking away again, do you look back now and you feel content or is there still something there bothering you? No. I look back and I hundred feel I, I feel a hundred percent content um, because part of being a champion is finishing the race. Part of being a yeah. champion is not just winning. You know what are you when you get your ass kicked? When you get your ass handed to? I've never I've never end up dead last in any show ever. You know, yeah. and that was the first time. You know, and a lot of people were saying, "Well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't this and lean up the show." I'll hit it. Yeah. That didn't even matter because I wasn't doing it for them. I wasn't doing it. It was something here, right? Yeah. Yeah. I and that. I don't care what people say. People tell, talk great things about me. They say negative things about me, but it didn't matter. I just had to put something the rest. I felt like I did. But when I walked out on stage, come on, man, after 14 years, they put me in the middle of <laughs> <laughs> Dexter Jackson, who had got second, yeah. and Mr. Olympia, Phil Heath. Yeah. And I'm standing right in the middle away from that stage of 15 years, I mean, hey, they gave me a shot, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> and normally if I was myself and the body that I needed to function, yeah, you know, you can't expect a, 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 um, a uh, mechanic to do a job if he doesn't have all his tools. The yeah. Picasso is just not going to get painted yeah, and it yeah. didn't get painted. So what happened was dig deep, right? Dig deep. And then that champion comes out and then, then you, then you go into that survival mode. You go into, you know, that, that, that mental mode, whether you can, you can either break down or you can say, Hey, you know what? I'm glad I'm here. Thank God I made it to the stage, the respect from uh, the audience, the respect from the industry and all my fans around the world was just enormous. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, Fuad, um, after sitting back and reviewing, I've never gotten a standing ovation at any show I ever did in my life, but I got one there yeah. probably because they were, they were, they, they were, they were supporting me. Well, maybe they felt sorry for me. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> I don't think it, if I had to guess, I took it brother. If I, had to, if I had to guess, I would say that uh, the standing ovation is probably a level of respect yeah. for somebody doing something they love and, and making it to the end. Mm. Cause like you said, you could have easily said, I don't look the way I used to look. I'm not doing it. I could have dropped out easily. I, I could have, yeah. You know, but I'm I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna lie to my fans. I'm not gonna make up something and, and drop out like that. I had to continue through, um, and I'm glad I did because I touched so many lives. I I woke a lot of people up who had doubt and who had given up on competing. And a lot of a lot of uh, people said, "Hey, man, you inspired me." It doesn't matter where you place. Just the fact of seeing yeah. you on stage, Kevin, going through the motions and everything, it touched us and it it made me realize that you know. If, if you have a dream or something out there, just just go after it and um, do it for yourself, you know, and, and, and put that to rest and, and then everything else will fall in place. And that, that's what I did. And I'm, 
it's one of the most memorable moments in my entire bodybuilding career, which mm -hmm. I have many. Mm -hmm. But this one right here is is that pitiful moment of is probably the one of the best Mr. Olympias I ever competed in and and had that experience of of being on the stage um considering all circumstances so that's yeah. uh that's kind of amazing to think considering how many times you've done the Olympia and how well you've done that mm -hmm. the time you did the worst was the time that meant one of the, is one of your yeah. most memorable moments but what how many uh, how many second places did you take at the Olympia or how many top fives actually more let's focus on second places how many times did you get second place uh four 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 times what mm -hmm what okay so i'm not going to try and compare my career to yours at all this is not what i'm doing but i've been in that second place spot where you're like it's bittersweet because you're like right there and is it when you walk off stage are you i know there's a i want to win obviously but is there any any joy in being second place in the world or is it just is it just so bitter that you were right there when i when i first got second at the mr olympia of course, yeah. you know, that's, I was like, wow, blew me away. You know, um, every, there's joy in every placement where I, where I place, you know, regardless of whether it's first, second or whatever, mm -hmm. fifth or, or dead last, I, I always come, come with something from that. Um, the joy of winning second place is definitely up there. Um, and getting my first Mr. Olympia in 1992 second to Dorian in Helsinki. It was just phenomenal. Um, finishing ahead of so many awesome, great bodybuilders and people who you look up to. It was just a dream come true. Uh, my first Olympia that happened. Um, I was like, wow. Then it happened again uh, to, to Dorian as well. I, I, I don't even know what year. I kind of wipe it out of my mind. But when it happens a third time on that same stage and when you leave that stage and you realize that, wow, I, I, I want everything out here. And then you're back and it happens again a fourth time. You're like, there's something going on here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, man? You're like, yeah. come on, there's, there's something going on here. And you're talking about, okay, I got second in 1992, my first Mr. Olympia. And I got second in between and i got second in 2002 like whoa, whoa you yeah. know but it seems like it's always what's 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 going on here and, and yeah. I, I don't know so were those like a bittersweet moment yeah i mean because at that point you know you're you're a seasoned guy and you're looking at it as business and you kind of know okay well maybe this is a business call maybe this and that but um Hey man, you you take the chips and you, you move with them, brother, and you, and, and and you and you continue to move forward. And had I never got second, and had I hold on to uh, yeah, someone's yeah, trying, yeah. it's okay. Somebody's trying to call me. Unfortunately, I it's okay. No big had I never those second places drove me to go and win everything else I possibly could compete in, and that's why that's why I ended up doing the whole world tours. To be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm when I look back at your second places, obviously there to Ronnie Coleman and to Dorian Yates, mm -hmm. did you know it was strictly a size thing or was there something else that you thought was holding you back? It was size. Uh, Dorian was phenomenal. You know, can I, before you um, answer, I'm sorry. Can I just say in 2000, in nine, sorry, 92, not 2002 In 92, mm -hmm. you're very close. Like, I, I feel like that was the closest of your second places. Would you agree with that? 92? Yeah. Like it was level. close. Yeah. 92 was, Dorian was 230 something, I believe. And I was uh, 229. So that, that was very, 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 very close. Um, yeah, it was very close. Uh, there were moments in shows that I thought the Olympia was close. But yeah, that was... That was certainly uh, one of them. Is there a different Olympia that you think in your heart that you were, you were better at or that you could have won instead of that one? Because yeah, from, a, from I, a, I, I like 2000. 2000. But didn't mm – -hmm. oh, no, that was 2001 that Jay took second. So 2000 you took second to uh, Ronnie. But that was – was that the year he did the 
It wasn't the year he did the Arnolds, was it? I can't quite remember if you are, to be honest yeah. with you. You know, what um, what what do you think was the difference, and why do you think you beat him in two thousand? What was the uh, what was your justification? Again, your reason? because I thought if you go back and you look at those pictures, uh, Ronnie's midsection was starting to extend at that moment. You know, he his he was starting to um, his midsection wasn't as tight as it was the previous years. That was when he was starting to gain a little more little you know he didn't have that tight look you know and in, in, in his compulsories he would he would let the let his you know let his midsection go and you could see it hanging out and everything mm -hmm. and um he wasn't as ripped and shredded that year and i felt like that year um going through the compulsories i felt like i had the better package do you mind if we look at a couple photos no okay so i'm just going to share my screen with you real quick mm -hmm. so this one's this one, the first one that caught my eye. I don't know if you can see that, but is this you patting his stomach? <laughs> yeah, that's it right there. <laughs> yeah. So you were you were pretty pretty incredible. But I mean, so Ronnie definitely had size, but you think your shape carried yeah. you? Yeah, I, I think the overall uh, shape and balance and and everything that I was presenting at that show had it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, oh, again, yeah. you know, you you're looking at you're looking at photos that aren't high definition, that are, you know, but still, yeah, everybody yeah. still looks the same. But yeah, I I felt like that show, that show was it because the audience actually, um, they, um, you know, um, <laughs> what do you call it? They expressed their opinion as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you you said you were two twenty nine in ninety two, which I think some people would be shocked at, but what do you think about the guys now? And I'm not asking you to say anything negative. I just, you know, you competed at the Olympia, <clears throat> your last Olympia with kind of the modern day guys. And, you know, the, I think the average stage weight is somewhere around 250. So what do you, what do you see? Do you see, do you feel like the guys are still good? Do you feel like the quality is still there? Do you feel like we've sacrificed size for, we've sacrificed quality for size? How do you feel about it? I think the guys are great. Um, I think uh, it's just a different era. The sport's taking a different turn. Mm -hmm. I was backstage with these uh, professional bodybuilders, and the size, I was like, wow, everybody was big. Yeah. You know, when I was competing, um, you know, if you were two, I think Dorian Yates was the only one to hit the stage at that point. Over 250, 250. Of course, you had Marcus Rule and John Pierre Fuchs and guys like that, but that was far too far in between. That was very rare, yeah. You know, and and if you noticed or not, the sport back then, you know, Dorian Dorian brought in that that freaky mass monster look. You know, he he went from two thirty to to bring it up all the way to two sixties, I believe. Yeah, he competed in, and we were chasing that. Now you go backstage. When I was backstage in two thousand and was it sixteen? I believe it was. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these guys are clear in the two fifties. Yeah, you know, and above. Yeah, and they have shape. You know, it was just they sacrifice the quality. Yeah, the quality because bodybuilding is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Look at Lee Labrada. You could take Lee Labrada. He could stand next to Lee Haney. Uh, Lee Labrada got second in the Mr. Olympia. You know, smaller, but when you get underneath the lights. Like I said, it's an illusion. Joe Eater always said, you know, about the waist, you know, you have to have that taper here to here, you know, and you have to know how to move and pose and accent and, and, and bring out that illusion on stage, you know. These are the things that was taught to us from Joe Weeder. Joe Weeder would spend time with us uh, uh, before competitions. We go to California to do photo shoots. You know, he would make sure we're in shape. You know, his guys would make sure we're in shape. He would teach us and show us how to control our midsections. Uh, that was so very important. The presentation of how to pose, when to pull a pose, you know, uh, how to go into a pose. All these things were, uh, were, were taught to us through Joe Weider. So we had these moments of understanding. Not only were you a pro, but he's going to hone you and teach you about the presentation. So he kind of like worked with us and taught us these things. 
before the show, we would do show photo shoots. After the show, we do photos in the middle of the show. Zoeta would be backstage during prejudging and everything, looking over each and every one of us. And you can actually see the difference. So we were going to, it was all about quality. It was about creating an illusion. And he'd always say, you know, it's, it's okay to be big, but you have to be able to present that and create that illusion. Which way you turn your arms is gonna, it's gonna create that illusion. So you don't necessarily have to be 250 or 260 or 270 on stage to be the best pre presentation or, yeah. or to be the best bodybuilder. You can be 200, 210, 215, you know, look at Sean Ray, 212, and yeah. would just smoke guys. Mm -hmm. Because that illusion, the small joints, the small tie-ins, but to get to that, to get to the skeletal system of your body, what do you do? You got to, you got to diet down. You got to diet all that fat down. You got to diet that water out of your system. And then you'll see the sculptor of yeah. true bodybuilding in that Greek uh, stature look that comes through. That's what I didn't see backstage, you know, Fuad, when, when I was present amongst, you know, uh, today's uh, bodybuilders, that was missing. Yeah. It was impressive to see these guys as big as they are, but they didn't, they didn't take it to do that detail refinement. Um, you know, like, like we were taught that, yeah. that, that was missing. That was the gap. So I have a couple of questions that come from that. And the first is how could somebody now, let's say somebody now said, you know what? I want to look like Kevin Lavroni. I want to bring that quality back. Mm -hmm. but the problem is, let's say that guy comes in on stage at two 30 and he looks phenomenal. He's got that same quality. You had same structure, same everything. Are the judges going to reward that guy? That's the, that's the problem. I think a lot of us are, I'm not really competing anymore, but even during my era, that's kind of what we would think is because when I started, I was smaller. Like my favorite physique version of my physique was around two thirty-five, but it was placing fifth, fourth, fifth, and they're like, you got to be bigger. So mm -hmm. I got bigger and that actually threw off my lines. But so if a guy now wanted to say, you know what, I want that quality. How's he going to do though? That's the problem. Like the judges kind of dictate where the sport is going. Yes, they do dictate to where's the, where the sport is going, but also there's a dominant erupt somewhere that can do it. I mean, um, you had Dorian Yates, then we had Ronnie Coleman, big, big Dorian, big Ronnie. Then we had big Jay Cutler. Then we had the phenomenal Phil Heath, yeah. who was smaller than those guys. Yeah. But he was just, his genetics was just, just phenomenal, right? Yeah. True. So Phil could get away with not being 260 or 250. Mm -hmm. Phil looked his best and, and yeah. had beat Jay, what? And in his forties, yeah. right? Yeah, probably early, probably you know, like lower forties. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Then what happened when he started getting bigger? Things started getting extended. Mm -hmm. So, I do believe that you can go the mass with the class. Now, look at the uh, when we came in, um, you know, the nineties, that ninety era, going through two thousand, you know, da, 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 da. Bodybuilders before us, they were cut, they were lean, they were shredded. But we we brought in that mass, you know, we took it up a notch and yeah. still had it there, you yeah. know. And so yeah, there there is, I believe that there is that guy out there somewhere that can do exactly what Phil Heath did. Um, and he he's out there. And I think the judges, when the judges see this, because these are seasoned judges, you're talking about Steven Weinberger and and uh Debbie Mannion and the whole crew. And, um, you know, they, they were judging us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they were judging Lee Haney. So they, they know, they know it when they see it. Um, it's just not out there for them to, uh, they just haven't seen it yet because yeah. when they do see it, they will reward it now. Okay. You know, I mean, you, you, you say, you know, Phil, and then, and they were going in that route with, uh, Sean Roden, you know? Yeah. And, and then it uh, was uh, Brandon Curry and, and, you know, you got Dexter Jackson. So it's there. Yeah. We just got to find that perfect combination um, yeah. to where it's not overdone. Yeah. I feel like it's tougher though, because 
when I think of 80s, I think of 90s, and I think of 2000s, the guys all kept getting a little bit bigger. Like, it's almost like your era in the 90s, you were afforded the perfect weight because you're Mm -hmm. like, you kind of maxed out the physique with muscle, but you were still able to hold the shape because it wasn't, it wasn't so big. And then I felt like in the 2000s, guys had to get even bigger. Well, I think now you've pushed Mm -hmm. past your genetic limits. And like you said, there is some guys like a Phil Heath who can pull off a 240, 250 and still look statuesque. But I think for the most part, is it true? Is it possible that the human body looks best in that 230, 240 range? And we've just gone past that now. No, I, I think it all depends on who it is. Ronnie Coleman looked better in the 250s. 260s, I believe. It's true. Yeah. yeah. True. Um, Fuwa, look, you take people always want to know, I, you know, what era is is better, uh, where we at now or where we were. Mm-hmm. Okay. And my training partner Scott Scott brought this analysis up. He says, "What other what in what other sport, uh, whatever, can you bring those guys? You could take a guy from the '90s and put him up on stage right now, right? Just say." Yeah, us at our best, right? Yeah, Sean yeah. Ray, Flex Wheeler, Dorian Yates, Ronnie Cohn. We're talking about at our best. Myself, Chris Cormier, Paul DeLetta, whatever, and stick us on stage in today's era, mm-hmm. right? I don't even like like. I mean, we could stand in this era right now. Yeah, yeah. you understand? Yeah. So, I mean, that goes to show that whatever. I don't know what happened back then. But um, it, it was something going on where that was the cream of the crop. And I think we could still get to that. I think you do have some bodybuilders that, that, that are pretty, pretty close to that, but they just got to fine tune, 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 tune things, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, the other thing I, I, I picked up on was you were talking about Joe Weider. Mm-hmm. And was it a major benefit to you guys that, I mean, part of the reason you say cream of the crop and I know not all of you guys were sponsored by Joe, but a lot of you were. Is it possible that he was the guiding influence as to why you guys were all so good? Like, of was course, he was he that involved that you he could keep everybody? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, for why? Because um, we had contracts. Uh, not all IFBB bodybuilders had contracts, but if you won the nationals, uh, you were more more likely to. I'm talking about the overall winner. Yeah, you're more likely to get a contract with uh, Weeder Publications, um, or the overall winner of the USA's. You know, back then it was, it was hard to yeah. to to win to win a show, and the overall winner. You know, hey, you 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 were, you were considered the number one runner going into the first pro show coming up, or you know, coming up into the Mr. Olympia. All eyes are going to be on you, right? But along with that contract, Fuad, you know, a lot of people, you just didn't receive that pro card and go home. Mm-hmm. When I got my pro card, um, Jim Mannion flew me straight to Joe Weider, uh, Woodland Hills in California. And I was faced with, you know, okay, we're going to bring you into, you know, Weider Publications. This is what we expect of you. Mm-hmm. We expect you to be in shape all year round, pretty much close to it. Yeah. We also expect you to represent the sport at the up with the utmost respect. We expect you to show up at these appearances and treat six, seven, eight appearances a year. We had to do, yeah. and um, and and be at these appearances to you know support you know the IFBB, the federation. Talk about the health. Talk about the health of the fitness industry. Yeah. And how the industry can benefit people around the world. Uh, then we were expected to show up at photo shoots, to be in shape for those photo shoots prior to any shows that we did. Prior to, the sh- I mean, after the shows that we did, we still had to do photo shoots. Joe Weider checked in after every competition that we did. Mm-hmm. He would he would check in and he would call us or he would say, "Hey, congratulations! How did you do?" They tracked every single thing that we were doing down to the T. Yeah. Um, and knowing that you have a job, a job to show up, not just the IFBB Pro, but if you didn't do these things and show up at these shows and, and maintain that certain conditioning, 
you know, and place out of the top five and top six, of the, you're going to lose your contract. Yeah. You know, you're going to lose your contract. It's just straight up. That's what it is. Mm. Um, so that responsibility was thrown on you and you were taught that, you know, even though you're a pro and you better not go out here and get into trouble. You better not go out here and say anything crazy, you yeah. know, and, 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 and disrespect the organization because you're going to lose your contract. You're going to get fined. If you show up for meetings late, you're going to get fined. I was fined $20,000 a couple of times because I didn't have my contract in on time and I didn't show up at the meetings on time and stuff like I should have. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that bar was here. Yeah. And um, you took that into the gym. You were training for a purpose and it wasn't all about you. It was about the responsibility you were taking on. But, you know, you were getting paid and and, and they were you were, you were, you know, you were flying around the world to represent. Yeah. Joe Eater was was awesome, man. And um, that was that was some incredible moments. You learned a lot about the business inside of uh, of the sport. And um, he, he branded each and every one of us like that. And he cared about it. he cared about us. He was there yeah. for us. That uh, can I call him a father figure or mentor? Yeah, of course you can. So, do you think I almost envy a little bit what you're saying because I didn't have that coming up, and I know the guys now don't have that. So, could that have been the factor that really made a difference with you guys and how you all came in a certain way every year and? There was a, a certain air of bodybuilding. Do you think it was Joe Weider's influence and that's why that air was there? Yeah, of course. Of course it was. Of course, man. Um, it was like, right now I have a son, right? My son's 14 years old. My son is going through the process of being, um, going to one of the elite high schools in the state of Maryland mm -hmm. for his gift, for his, his talents. He's been sifted through. He's been, when I say sifted through, when I'm saying they've, they've looked at his grades ever since sixth grade. Yeah. Now he's in eighth grade. Now he's going into ninth grade, but they've looked at his history. They looked at his parents. They they're looking at his grades. They're monitoring everything that he does because guess what? There's 300 kids yeah. trying, trying to get into this spot. And when you go into that spot, right. And he's been accepted. But everything's got to be intact. My son is going like you know he's he's a, he's a football player, wide yeah. receiver. Yeah. But it 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 when you get the cream of the crop and you sift through that, and you know like the coach said, there's 300 kids coming in here. You know 900 total, but you know out of 300 athletes, we're going to pick such 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 such. This is around the whole state, right? Mm -hmm. And um, how do you get there? It's the same thing what Joe did with bodybuilding, man. Yeah, he picked the top guys. Not only you know. Well, he saw, but he also molded these guys for that position. Yeah. You know, yeah. to say you're a weeder athlete, you know, it was something grand because not everybody made it. Not everybody got that opportunity to, to even communicate with Joe Weeder. Yeah. You know, yeah. so his vision was molded through the ideas of where he saw where their sport went. And that's, that's what was so incredible about how our sport, the roots were deeply rooted and what it stands for and um that right there is a foundation man that that this sport that the ifbb is built on yeah so when i see people being i have oh i'm ifbb you know all right yeah you're you're, you're a professional bodybuilder you know but there's a <laughs> there's a disconnect somewhere you know uh with that in, in today's um era but that's kind of what I, I think that's what I meant. I, I was kind of alluding to was it's almost like he is from what you're saying. It sounds like he was kind of the glue, the foundation, the mentor, the one, the one that kept everybody in line and kept an era of the sport. Whereas now I feel like you're kind of on your own, especially, mm -hmm. especially now, not just 2000, especially now, you know, there is no magazine contracts. There is nobody kind of leading and keeping everybody in a group and keeping everybody doing like the same thing. And, showing respect for the sport. Everybody kind of does what they want and you make your fans the way you can make them, whether it's in a mm -hmm. negative way or a positive way, it's kind of like a free for all now. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like I'm personally a little envious that you had like that structure. Yeah. That structure to follow yeah. to kind of show body, what bodybuilding really was. So 
It's I mean, look at it. Look, I mean, look, look for. I didn't mean to cut you off, but oh, it's okay. Um, you know, it stems back to Joe's vision. He brought Arnold here, right? Yeah. He in 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 the whole Colombo and the Ferrigno and the whole pump and iron, just that whole whole thing. Um, yeah, man, it, it it runs deep, and it was a family. You know, family. When I say family. You know, we we cared, we loved, we we were there for one another on tours. Uh, Joe would always fly all of us to California. The ones that didn't live there, he would fly us in. We would have meetings. You know, all of all of his uh, athletes would have. We would show up for meetings, and, and he would ask us, "What do we think about? How will what would we like to see this go to this? And and what do we think the magazines should do?" And he would introduce us to the writers of the magazines and in the editors of the magazines and just the whole vision. There was a, we knew, we knew what was going on. We knew what to expect that year. You know, yeah. we, we knew, I knew what I was doing eight, nine months, 10 months out every year. My schedule was set. I knew what I'd be doing next month, the month after where I would be, you know, and it, it, we don't have that structure. These guys don't have that structure. They have to go out and find that on their own nowadays. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, the business side of it, that aspect is just, it's thrown up in the air. And I almost feel, I almost, I feel sorry, not sorry for them, but um, it, it's so much more. I, I feel like it could be tapping into so much more of their potential. Yeah. If that structure was in place for these, for these, uh, for these pros today. So as a supplement company owner, I'm pretty sure you probably have some athletes signed to your, to your uh, roster. Do you feel like the guys now have it harder or easier because of the responsibilities you had, but you also had a check? So it's like, I kind of see it two ways, right? Like, I feel like now maybe we, the guys have less responsibility, but they kind of have to earn their own dollars. Whereas mm -hmm. as a weeder athlete, you maybe had more responsibility, but you had a clear check coming to you every week or every month. So Yeah, but it, you had to earn that though. No, no, I'm not saying you didn't have to yeah. earn it. I'm just saying it was almost like you knew that money was coming, whereas now you do have a supplement contract, but might not be as big, and you have to make money in like three, four, five different places, mm -hmm. whereas before it was kind of one place. We're, I mean, you know, I think uh, there's it's a plus plus. It's a plus plus, you know, because you got social media. You can market yourself. These guys can build their empires any way they want. Um, they still have uh, supplement companies out there who – are giving, you know, athletes contracts and giving these athletes opportunities and everything. Bottom line is this. Um, if you don't have whatever you have, you have to make the best of it and you have to build a business out of each and every opportunity you have. Business is, you know, why, why, why are you doing this? Are you doing it for your ego or are you doing it or you want to turn it into a business, you know? So mm -hmm. we'll always look at the positive things that, that you have. I and mean, I think today um, with the, what, what we have right now, as far as the outreach globally around the world with social media, you don't, you don't necessarily have to even have a IFBB pro card to be no. successful or to market yourself and to be a phenomenon. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's just the icing on the cake nowadays, you know? So back in the day, yeah, you needed that. Nowadays, you don't even need that to uh, to parl all off and 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 to build an empire. You True. know, I see a lot of guys doing it in today's industry, and thank God, you know, everything is evolving. Everything is evolving uh, in the right direction, and will continue to evolve. You know, um, mm -hmm. for the greater, better, and the greater good. Um, I, I just think that you know, as far as you know, thinking now, I mean. So we are, yeah, great foundation for where we were in time and moment right now. But so everybody has to make adjustments to, to the opportunities that they have in front of them. Yeah. Uh, I want to change gears a little bit. There's a question I have to ask you because it's one that I have wondered ever since I started bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. So everybody talks about the time off in between shows Kevin Lavroni used to take. Yeah. Can you tell me first, was that something you did from the very beginning of your bodybuilding career? And did you do it every year or was it just later on in your career? It wasn't anything that I did in the very beginning. In the very beginning of my career, I worked my butt off uh, yeah. every single day to turn pro to get to that point. When I won the Maryland, I was 206 in 1990. 
1991, I was 236. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I, I well, boom. <laughs> I worked my ass off. Um, <laughs> you know what happened, Fuad? It, it kind of happened when I came home from the 92 Olympia. Yeah. I got home from getting second in my first Mr. Olympia. September. Went on a tour. I came home. And I tore my chest in February. I was bench pressing, it was cold in the gym. I, I, I ripped my chest. I just got home from the tour, I tore my chest, uh, bench pressing 600 pounds. I blew out my uh, pectoralis, a major and minor, snapped my tenant. Yeah. I was out, done. Didn't work out for six months. Didn't tell Joe Weider. <laughs> I remember calling Jim May and I said, I slightly injured my chest. <laughs> slightly injured yeah. my chest. <laughs> yeah. I called Lee Haney. Lee Haney said, how'd you do it? I said, oh, I was doing dumbbells. And I lied. I lied because I was scared and I didn't want to tell them exactly what happened because I, I knew that I might lose my contract. Yeah. Because nobody voter had ever came back from a chest tear and competed and did well. Mm -hmm. um, it was very down in the gutter for me, six months. I lost close to 40 pounds. My body went from 240 something to 220, 219. I was in a partial body cast. My first surgery, I had a, I had a 12 hour surgery. Had to go back a week later, I got infected. Uh, Kevin Tessworth was my doctor, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, he operated on a dead body first, a cadaver, because I didn't want him cutting me here. He went underneath my armpit. Yeah. So I didn't train for six, seven months. I lost a lot of weight. Um, took my partial cast off. I couldn't even do a push up. I couldn't even bench a 45 pound incline bar. It hurt so bad. This was in July. I had to be on stage to compete in the Olympia in September. Back then, Olympia was September. I think it was September the 12th, July. So you had August, July, August, and September. Three months I had to I had to get yeah. from 220, whatever. Yeah. Going back to figuring out how to train, how to do anything. And I did all that in three months. And I think in 1993, I came back. I think I might have placed in the top five. Yeah. Can, can you Google that? I can, I can look it up, See, yeah. Look that up. See where I place because I went from second down, and that's what happened. Um, was uh, it sixth place I got? Or let fifth? me see if I can find it here. I'm not not the best with this. Uh, 1993, let, Mr. Let me Lincoln. just go Kevin Lavroni <laughs> contest history. Yeah. All right, let me see here. Two thousand nope, nineteen ninety three. It is fifth. Yeah. Fifth. So in three in three months, you went from not bearing not being able to bench anything to fifth place at the Olympia with a torn chest, with a torn pec. Yeah. Okay. With the torn. So you know yeah. what I said. Damn. If I don't, I said if I had more time, God knows what I can do. Mm -hmm. So something click. So if I had more time to prepare, I could take these guys out. So you know what I did? I said, all right. Arnold came to me. He said, hey, do you mind coming to the Arnold Classic? No problem. I went to the Arnold Classic in 1994, and I won. Yeah. I was back. So I trained from the <laughs> Mr. Olympia to that Arnold in March. Yeah. So I was back 100%. Okay. Then I realized, man, I won an Arnold Classic. Hmm. I don't need, I said, if I'm healthy, I don't need to train all year round. All I need is three months, four months. <laughs> and that, that's how I stumbled over that. I thought it was a stupid idea, but it wasn't a stupid idea. Yeah. It happened because I was injured. And so I got second in the Arnold. I know I won the Arnold classic in 94. And, um, you know, that was it for me. I was like, you know what? I can do what it takes these guys 12 months to do. I could do it in four months, three months. Okay. This, and that's it, what I did. Okay. This, that's exactly kind of what I thought. So let me, now I have to ask you the question I really wanted to get to. 
Yeah. Which is, is there a, a place in your mind where you think, had I kept going all year round, maybe I would have been better? No, no. You know that for certain? Yeah, because when I did go for what, I went balls to the walls for four months. Like, I went balls to the walls. My body was hurting. My body was maxed out. There was times, man, where when I, I, I didn't think I was going to make it, to be honest with you, because I realized that my body was a hyper responder and I could gain muscle so quick in such a short period of time. I could go from 225 to 245, close to 256. I was 256 at the Arnold one year, and I put on all that weight in three months, and it was muscle. I was like, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. Listen, I, I mean, you know, I, I look, man, there was times when my blood pressure was up. I knew it was up. My body was just transitioning so, so quick and so fast that it was too much. Sometimes I would have nosebleeds. I remember this, man. I'm like, you can tell when you're at, when you maxed out. Yeah. Mm-mm. If I had a state on that pace all year round, I wouldn't be here right now. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Bro. So is that, but is that a symptom of, is that a symptom of your genetics or is it a symptom of the fact that you trained so hard that you actually couldn't do it all months of the year? I think both. I, I think uh, at some point, probably the amount of muscle that I, I could put on mm-hmm. if I train all the, all the year around. Because you got to think about it, man. In nineteen in, in two thousand in nineteen ninety, um, when I competed in the Maryland, I was two hundred and six pounds. At the at the nationals a year later, I was two thirty six. But wasn't you know? there some? But wasn't there something that said to you, "Hey, you know and, what? But what if? What if you said maybe it's better if I go ninety percent for twelve months instead of a hundred percent for four months?" Yeah, but back then you're not thinking. There's no, no such you're thing. Not, you're not thinking about it. You're just in this mindset that you're going to train all out, all out, all out. And for me, I couldn't do it. For me, it was all out or nothing. That's right. And when I went to the show, I went to the show. I was all out. And yeah. when I got done, I was done. So I was going to come home and keep pushing it and pushing and pushing it. It would, would have been too much. And I, I just got that mindset. And it's still like that today. Either I'm all in on something yeah. or I'm just not going to do it. So I had to walk away. And, you know, then all the other I had other responsibilities. I owned a business. I had Worlds in Fitness Center that I had built in 1993. And I had that gym through my whole career. That was, four, that was 15,000 square foot yeah. to where I you know, still have to manage that gym. I had uh, a lot of employees and everything working for me. So the time that I wasn't uh, bodybuilding, I was in mentally focused on, on, on business stuff that I had going on outside mm-hmm. of sport of bodybuilding because there's life before and after bodybuilding, right? Yeah, of course. So, yeah. So when you say all or nothing, um, I don't want to get into the X's and O's of your, of your mm-hmm. training, but like, I've heard stories, you know, Kevin ate fish and only fish for like months on end to get in shape. Like I hear these stories and I don't know if they're rumors and they kind of just change over time or like, what is all in on a diet? Cause I've heard, you know, Kevin sleeps on the floor because it's harder and he likes to suffer. Like I've he- I hear these things and I'm like, is mm-hmm. this real or is this yeah, it's true? Can you explain that? I mean, just the mindset of uh, going without, you know, um, I didn't put any season on my food. Um, Fish for 12 weeks, you know, flounder. Um, Fish, rice, and broccoli, you know, 12 weeks. Um, I would do an hour cardio in the morning, hour cardio at night. I had to stop eating my meals at 7 o'clock at night. Um, Yeah, so... uh, you know, you, you kind of like go through this pain and suffering. I didn't eat red meat. I wasn't in the red meat. I started throwing in turkey burgers every now and then. But yeah. when I got six weeks out from the show, it was strictly fish, rice, and broccoli. There was a moment where uh, sometimes I would just eat. Um, I would take rice and, and roll it up into the fish. And I would just eat that for like two weeks, zero carbs for two weeks. Uh, already being in shape and having my body fat below three percent, I would I would I would just experiment and do this stuff for the psyche for the mindset. 
Um, I didn't want to sleep in, the, in my bed. I don't want to be around anything that was comfortable. I wanted to feel like, you know, you know, I, I didn't need anything. I just needed a place to lay my head that was on the floor and visualize and focus of why I was doing it, the purpose, the end of the road, you know, the hardcore stuff that I was dealing with when I was in the gym. I'd wake up five o'clock in the morning. I'd go to the gym on an empty stomach. I'd do cardio for an hour. Right after that, I would eat my first meal. I would stay in a gym. I would train my abs. Uh, and then I would go through my first workout for about two hours. Then I would go home. I would eat my next meal at 10 o'clock. I'd go to sleep to 12 o'clock, wake up, eat my meal. Then I would go back to the gym, eat a meal. Yeah, I would eat a meal, go back to the gym. I eat it. I eat every other hour. I yeah. ate, my first meal was nine o'clock. Uh, yeah, nine o'clock, ten o'clock. Uh, you know, one o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock. Back to the gym, yeah. training from six o'clock to eight o'clock. Um, you know, done doing a cardio. So this is my cycle. This is my cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wouldn't live outside of the cycle. I wouldn't go to the mall. I wouldn't go to the movies. I wouldn't go to eat dinner nowhere. I wouldn't go to family reunions. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk to nobody. I wouldn't do anything. I just stay locked away. And I think when I, I go to my, my room and I did, I had guns on the floor and stuff. I would just see, sleep in the middle of them. <laughs> and I was just, yeah, on, on, on plain hard floor. And I was just going, going through the motions of what, what I'm preparing for. And that was the Mr. Olympia, you know, to go on stage and do battle. That's how serious I took it for, uh, for three or four months. You know, a lot of times I didn't go to family reunions. I didn't spend a lot of time with my family. Um, out of the seven years, I probably out, out of fourteen years, probably missed seven family reunions, and um, it's almost like I was in a war zone, which I was in a war zone, you know. And that's how serious I took it. I took my training and my dieting, uh, and the reason why I was cycling very, very serious. You know, my life was on the line, my health was on the line, and I. I just wasn't going to play with it. And I wasn't, it was when I walked out on that stage, you know, I meant business. I mean, I was going up against Dorian Yates for God's mm -hmm. sake, mm -hmm. you know, and you see all these black and white pictures of him over there in, um, in England. I mean, just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, <laughs> there was just no time for, uh, to let up off the gas. Um, so that's what I did. And I felt like I was in shape. I went and I presented myself to the show. Then after the Olympia, I went on the European tours. Yeah. Can I ask, um, what, have you heard the term bro science? No. Okay. So there's a, the prevailing term nowadays is bro science. And it usually is used on anything that is nece not necessarily proven by science, but usually stuff that like gym bros will say is like something you should do. Mm -hmm. I just find it interesting. Everything you mentioned is something nowadays that these younger guys, not the professional bodybuilders, but these younger guys on Instagram would scoff at. And I always try and tell people that experience matters more than what you read in your textbook. And I just find it interesting that you just said, you know, the, mm -hmm. the eating fish for, you know, six weeks straight or just fish and rice and broccoli and, you know, not eating after seven and all these things are things that people are trying to dispel is not being necessary, but it works and you proved it. So I just kind of want to make that point to people watching that, like, just because it doesn't, you didn't read it in a science book or you can disprove that it works. There's somebody sitting here now that like, kind of, you lived your whole career that way, I guess. Right. Yeah. And, and it worked. Yeah. It worked, worked, worked for me. You know, it worked for me. Um, that's what worked for me. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, it just gave me a clear conscience when I walked out on stage, when I went through my posing routines, I went through my mandatories. I know at that point that I didn't cheat. I know at that point I did everything that I could do to prepare for that, for that moment, for that weekend. Yeah. Um, are you kind of of the mind that I'm trying to relate to your mindset? So, you know, let's say you're eating a chicken breast and rice. I've had my sister make it for me when I was in prep. And it tastes better. And I'm like, what'd you do to this? She's like, well, I seasoned it and I added some lemon juice and whatever, all things that you're allowed to have in a diet. But I'm like, it's, it tastes too good. So it doesn't feel like I should be eating it. Is that kind of what your thought process was? Like it's, if it tastes right, if it tastes too good, it's not, 
it's not part of my diet. Does that make sense? Yeah, you felt like you're not deserving of it. This is this is uh this is um you know sacrifice time. I'm not supposed to be around anything that smells good or eat or anything that eat. I'm not gonna do that. So I, I didn't I didn't indulge in any of that stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you have an air about you that is kind of different than everybody else, and I think you had it when you were competing as well. You know, people would say your posing routines, your charisma on stage, but I'm noticing it off stage too. Like I noticed it in your Instagram posts or if you do an Instagram live, or even now as we're talking, mm -hmm. you seem to have more of a relaxed outlook on life, kind of like take things as they come. Has it always been that way? Or is that something that's come with age? Or have you always been this person that's kind of above kind of, it's almost like it seems like you don't get involved in any negativity. You're very kind of at yeah. peace or enlightened in a way. Yeah, because um, look, I mean, who I, uh, you know, I don't keep saying this, but when you, when the first funeral you ever go to in your life is your father's and he's buried a few days before Christmas, uh, you don't have a Christmas tree that year and your father used to take you to school and pick you up every day and you're standing outside of school and you got to walk to the school bus and daddy's not there to pick you up and all this happened within 30 days my whole life just was turned um in a different direction and um we're not in control of if tomorrow's promised you know the only thing that we can control is how we treat people and how we think the here and now the situation now what are we going to do about it and what we say the here and now, you know, it's going to be left and gone. It's going to be here long after we're gone. Mm -hmm. So I just, um, I, I'm thankful for, for every breath that I take in, in every moment, in every situation. Um, you know, life is, uh, life is a very interesting journey. And I just, what I've been through, um, you know, with the hand that God has dealt to me, I mean, it come at a huge price. I mean, I I didn't have a father growing up, unfortunately. Uh, it was six of us. And my mother had to raise six kids uh, by herself. I was the youngest. Uh, we were two years apart. Um, he died from cancer. My mother ended up dying from cancer. Uh, two years before I turned pro, she she died from cancer as well. Uh, I had to bury her myself and watch her go through that for six years. And that's what my father went through. And now my mother has to suffer. And it's just uh, it, it, it's a very uh, humbling experience. And it lets you know that, um, you know what, we're, we're only known by what we leave behind us and what, the, what we're going to be remembered as when we're gone. Um, my father was a good, strong man. He, he respected my mother and, and tried to treat us well. Uh, wasn't his fault. He just, you know, God took his life for cancer. Uh, same with my mother. And my mother always said, Kevin, you know, don't blame God for anything. You know, um, I know you're upset because your father died, but I don't have the answers. Maybe one day. Everything will make sense to you. And uh, I was, you know, angry, upset. Kids made fun of me going to school because mm -hmm. I didn't have a father. I hated school, man. I didn't even want to be around how, school. All I know is. Do you mind? Sorry. Do you mind me asking how old you were when your father passed? 10, 10 years 10. old. And you're, and you're how old? When, yeah. your mom, when your mom passed, how old were you? 22. Okay. So. And they both had cancer. Uh, that was a reason why I really got into bodybuilding. You know. that's kind of where I was going with that is, is mm -hmm. so when your when your father passed, when did the, when did bodybuilding start? Like how soon after that? Right after that, I think uh, I got into martial arts uh, around 12, 11 years old. I started getting into martial arts, studying martial arts, studying Bruce Lee, the power of the mind, um, the philosophy and all this stuff. I studied a lot of stuff about Bruce Lee and the martial arts and uh, the yin and yang and, tapping into the inner strength of, uh, of, of who you are as a human being and being able to take and control your environment around how you think, you know, 
what you believe in, you know, Om Namah Shivaya, right? Mm-hmm. Or you, whatever you believe you can achieve. And all these things came to me. Um, and I, I, I saw um, a difference and just a growth within myself as a, as a young man. And regardless of whatever situation I was in, it wouldn't affect me. You know, like I control my own situations. Situation didn't control me anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And then I realized that, you know, hey, there's something there. And I just took and curled that into, I didn't want to play uh, uh, sports with uh, on a team. I didn't need a team. All I needed was to believe in myself, believe in yourself, you, you can create things. And I went to the gym and I just saw my body changing. I saw the creation coming. I saw these things happening because I would apply uh, eating. I would apply training. I would apply, you know, meditation, the mind psyche, no matter what's going on around you, you don't let it affect you. And if, you know, you affect your surroundings. So that was it for me, man. I had tapped into something that was, uh, that could be taken away. So, yeah. So would you say, and I, I don't want me to keep harping on it and I apologize for your losses, but, would you say that after your father passed, it was it almost like an introverted thing that happened? Like, did you, did you change mm-hmm. completely? Yeah, I did. You know, I didn't want to be around people. I didn't want to play sports. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to be by myself. Yeah. But it's, it was a devastating moment. Oh, you know, uh, I just recently read a book uh, called the obstacle is the way and it's kind of what you're talking about with mm-hmm. uh, not letting other things kind of affect how you think or how you, uh, move through life and using obstacles to actually be better. Mm-hmm. You mastering that at such a young age is kind of phenomenal. Like, how did you, like, how did you figure out how to not let other influences affect you at such a young age? The most devastating thing in the world happened to me. I mean, so you felt you like know, after uh, after that, nothing could permeate. Nothing could hurt me. Yeah. No, I've been through it. Nothing. I mean, eh, come on, man. It's like, that's the first time I saw a casket. That's the first time I was introduced to death. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, here we are as a child in, in sixth grade, right? Yeah. And look at me now. Look at me now. I mean, my mother and father are gone, but daddy left. I had to figure out a lot of stuff, man. And uh, there was no, there was no book written, dictionary written or anybody to, you know, say, Hey, do it this way. You're going to turn into a great bodybuilder or anything. No, I had to, I had to figure that out on my own. What was I going to be? So if it's up to me, you could, so I would say, you know, and people, it's like, it comes from that true place, whatever you believe you can achieve bad times don't last forever. As long as you never give up, you'll never lose, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I not, I don't criticize anyone because I haven't walked in their shoes. I don't know that person's journey. So there's an old, um, Indian prayer that goes, um, uh, great spirit grant that I may not criticize my neighbor until I've walked a mile in his moccasin. So I don't think any of us has walked a mile in another person's shoes. So who are we to look down or criticize anyone, right? Mm-hmm. So I, 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 don't, I always just see the best of it, of every situation, regardless of whatever's, whatever it is, you know, whether it's death, because there's strength in death as well. My father had never died. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be in bodybuilding. I would have never searched um, the body and, and, and how the body can do things and evolve and all these things. Mm-hmm. So that gave me that, that, that what I needed in the gym. I didn't need a team. I just needed something with them. So lifting the weights, I created that, right? Fortunately, yeah. uh, my, my the world knows Kevin Leroni because that's my pain turned inside out. Mm -hmm. um just hold on and and, you know there's always light at the end of the tunnel right so now i'm here but it ain't about me it's not for me it's about me me being able to uh enjoy and understand why that happened for this moment and it ain't about me for me to say hey kids guy who's going through something hey that dude who got cancer that kid who's who doesn't have a dad or a mom hey i was there man you know, you just hold on because it didn't make sense to me when I was 10. Didn't make sense to me why I was getting picked on school or whatever, but it makes sense to me now. So just hold on and hang in there, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, everything will come full circle. Your true purpose for your life will be revealed to you, man. 
when I take the, you, you know, I say you're an introvert and you agree. And then I wonder to myself, how did the charisma come out on stage though? Because on stage you were the, probably the most charismatic. I mean, <laughs> well, well, no, because to be honest with you, like it didn't look to me as a fan, like your posing routines were extremely like planned out choreographed. Like there was some stuff that was choreographed, but a lot of it seemed like free, but that's what fans wanted from you because there was, mm-hmm. I don't know what you did on stage that was different, but you seemed to capture people, capture people's attention more than other bodybuilders. So being an introvert, but then also having that performance kind of aspect, how does that make, people can't make sense of that. Mm. Um, I think when you live in the moment, when you're, when you're able to see something and um, let that be a part of where you are in life at that, in that moment in real time, then real things start to happen, you know? Um, I feel that feeling of how it felt when I was at my father's funeral for the first time. I felt something and, and, and I responded to that. When I go out on stage, I never practice a posing routine. I always picked out certain music that I like because it made me feel a certain way. I had three songs, depending on the auditorium, I would go to the auditorium before uh, prejudging would start or the night show would start. And I would tell the guy, play the music and I would, hear the music in that auditorium and I would think about the crowd. Then other guys would go out and pose before me at the night show and I would hear the crowd and I would just choose one of those pieces of music. And that's why I'd always get 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 fined because I would never have a music in on time. <laughs> <laughs> and I would pick that music and everybody's like, he didn't hand his music in on time. He didn't do this. But I just wanted to just be in the moment. And then I heard that crowd say, okay, I'm going to use this song. So when I went out there, it was just like, it became one, right? I was like, yeah. okay, here it is, right? It became one, wasn't hers. And then I would just, I, I would just start going. I would just start moving and being in that moment and just feeding off the crowd. And it just became something that was, uh, was not planned. It was just a true moment, yeah. right? I think that, I think that actually gets people more excited. It's almost like, I feel like people can feel what you're feeling when you're on stage. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I missed that too. When I was on, on, when I was competing, oh, damn, man, that was awesome. I tried to do it when I did my comeback, but it just didn't work. <laughs> you weren't, you weren't feeling it? No, <laughs> cause I didn't have, I didn't have the body. Something just wasn't right. So okay. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Last thing I'm gonna let you go. Cause I know it's been w- well over an hour, so I apologize, but, um, the same question I kind of have about your music. So I know you're passionate about your music and you have a band and, um, is that also like an outlet to kind of break out of that introvert mold or what is, is it just because you love music? Is there, is there something you're getting from that, that makes you want to keep doing it? Yeah. It makes me feel good. Um, it, it makes me feel good. Uh, you know, that music is a universal language. I think like posing on, when you're moving on stage and everything, it's just, I don't know for why. That's just a, it's just a side that, um, that I feel comfortable with because music takes you on journeys, you know, that nothing else will take you on, you mm-hmm. know. Um, I play the piano, uh, I play drums, uh, a little bit of guitar. And I just, I like, I like, I like, I like art. I like uh, things that can be created from thoughts and creations, right? So music is, is, is that part of uh, that inner spiritual connection of something, a piece of someone that they created or something that you can create. It's something that you can create that's original and original always has something that's very, very powerful. It's a powerful message and originality because no one's never seen it or heard it before. Mm-hmm. Is there something, is, is there, when you played those uh, instruments, is, are they, did you pick them up right away or was it something you worked at? And that's no, also- I just, I never took lessons on how to play it. I could just play music. Yeah. I could just play. I that's... never took piano <laughs> lessons or guitar lessons or drum lessons. I could just play instruments. That's so yeah. disheartening. You know, I've been trying to play. The, I, no, I'm, I'm serious because I've been trying to play the drum. I'm trying to play the drums and really, 
Yeah, man, I, I love the I love music. It's like it's it's a made and I, I kind of identify with what you're saying about being on stage. People ask me about my routines, and it's literally the same thing. I just mm -hmm. I kind of have to feel. I've talked to other bodybuilders like I don't even hear the music, and I'm like, how can you not hear the music? That's like the best part of being on stage. Uh -huh. So, but no, I want to play the drums, and you know, I used to do this podcast with Luke, and. Luke said the same thing to me. He's like, you know, when I started drumming, I just picked it up and I could just do it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so disheartening because I sit down at those things and I'm like, I can't fucking drum for shit. Like, I, just, really? I suck. <laughs> like, you have a set? What kind of set you have? I don't even know what kind of, I don't even know the brand name or anything. It's just, you know, it's the traditional drum set. And how long you been, is it a five piece? Yes. Floor two times. Yes. Yeah. Floor two times and then the bass. Yeah. 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 So I'm like, you know, how I can, long you been into it it's something i've wanted to do forever but my yeah. wife did my wife just bought me uh the set like four or five years ago and i started Dude, you, gotta, you gotta play that man well i started and i started practicing and i'm like i could kind of start carrying that like yeah. normal beat that's in all like most right. most rock songs or whatever and then i just the four count yeah and i but i couldn't do anything else <laughs> so it's like yeah. so i got kind really? of bored. yeah i got frustrated and i'm like ah, so i haven't yeah. really, i haven't picked it up but yeah but. it's the old four count man four count two count you know boom, boom, boom. yeah i started off uh um when i was uh 11 12 years old i got a a lug a ludwin uh blue sparkle ludwin set man that was my first set it was a five piece uh ludwin set I started off on that. Um, I always like Ludwig sets uh, and zillion symbols. I uh, graduated from that and I went to a DW set. I don't know if you about D know about DW set. I'm not, yeah. I'm ended not. up having a, a DW rack set with all the zillion symbols and everything. Um, but yeah, man, music is, uh, it's awesome. But yeah, drumming, drumming is, <laughs> you probably have problems with the hi-hat. You yeah. know, and the snare, the crack, you know, I've, you know, like that. I, and then the foot, the foot coming down, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like not, the bass drum, yeah, the floor yeah, drum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, that I can do that. crosses people up a lot. Yeah. No, I got that part. I got that part. I just, anytime I drew, anytime I try and deviate from that, it gets oh, all, really? it, it gets all messed up. That's the only thing I can do is what you just described. Everything else you can't do the drum roll and keep it back intact and no, it never sounds right. rides and it never sounds right. I try, I try to do <laughs> the drum, I try to do the drum roll and it sounds like I'm doing both hands at once. It's just a mess. Yeah. Man. So now, do you, do do you listen to music and try to play along to a song? Yeah, that's what I. I <laughs> it's funny. So I'll put my headphones on and I'll put whatever rock songs I like, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll try and kind of keep along, right? But. The rock songs I like are impossible. Like Metallica is like, yeah, you the can't do that. That's best, just the best drummer on her. Yeah, yeah, it's right. So yeah, those dudes are way out there. And then I'll ask my wife after I'll be like, so how'd that sound? And she's like, you sound like shit. She's like, you, mm. <laughs> you got a long way to go. So, you know, I pick easier music like Tragically Hip or something like. Yeah. With a, a little bit. You should you should try like, um, you know, the first song that I learned on drums was Brick House by the Commodores. Do you know that song? She's a brick. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do know that song. Yeah, I know that house. song. Yeah. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> She's my to my to. You know, that's, a, yeah. you should try to play that because it's the same. Yeah. Brick, house, right? Yeah. And when you get that pattern down like that, like that old school 70s uh, R&B music, there's not a lot of rides, not a lot of riffs, yeah. not a lot. It's just straight, straight grooving. Yeah. Try that, man. And and then gradually get into uh the whole uh the rush. I can I can know, do Neil I Perk. I don't know if you listen to Tragically Hip at all. They're a they're kind of they're Canadian I would say alternative mm -hmm. or rock. I don't know, alternative rock, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, it's that same beat you're just describing. Yeah. And I'm and I'm good with that. But if I try and do go, <laughs> go off of that, it's a fucking mess. So anyway. It ain't happening. <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll figure it out one day. What color is your set, man? uh black yeah like wow white nice. top with the black yeah so yeah i don't know it was it was a nice gift i just got to get back at it you know luke used to tell me you just got to keep practicing but it's disheartening when i talk to yeah. i would talk to luke or i talk to you and you're like yeah i just kind of mm -hmm. picked it up and i'm like oh okay so i guess you know i don't have the musical hand <laughs> like other people do but so. you know what you can you can you can learn it though a lot of people uh learn how to play instruments 
Yeah. You know, I should have uh, probably played more, more of, of the drums, you know, but what when you that? have a lot of gifts and a lot of talents, it's sometimes a curse because you can like, it's too much. Yeah. But it's also nice because you, know? you can kind of do whatever you want. So. It's nice sometimes when you're, when you're walking through a hotel room or something, a hotel a lobby and you see a baby grand and you get down and start doing your little thing and people will start coming around. You're like, wow. Is that, ha- has that happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're like a natural yeah. performer then you kind of just, it comes out of you. Yeah. I, li- I like, I like music. Yeah. Is it, is it yeah. that you like performing or, and I'm not just talking about no. music. I'm talking about bodybuilding like- too. Do you, do you just like what you like, or do you actually like performing for people? I don't necessarily think it's the like of the performing for people. I like the way it sounds and I like the way it makes me feel when I'm yeah. doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I like. Yeah. You know, and then people come around. It's it's embarrassing when people come around, but yeah. they're there because they feel something. So yeah, it feels good. Yeah, I like that. And you're like, man, that's that's pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Like uh Ron Harris, uh Ron Ron sent me a text today. Um I was in I made a video. Um anyway, it's it's on it's on face, it's on uh YouTube. I think I was behind a piano, I was doing something, playing some kind of piano riffs. Ron Harris said, uh, he goes, Hey, is that a a guy asked me if that a was that a natural riff or a riff that you know um was written by someone. I said, no, I was just be- behind the piano, just playing around. Mm-hmm. Um, and I came up with that melody, you know? Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. yeah. You got another call? Um, no, okay. that was my battery saying it's low. That's okay. <laughs> Either way, it's a sign. Um, all right, Kevin, listen, I appreciate uh, you making the time and us finally getting to sit down and talk. Um, maybe we'll do it again if you have time sometime. Yeah. Do some catching up. Thanks, for uh, man. I really appreciate it. It was an enjoyable moment. Thank you yeah. for uh, having me on your show. Okay, man. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Okay, Peace. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.